So um, now for something a little bit different than what we've had before. Uh, so what we've been working on is um, some non-x86 hardware. So generally, everyone's working on, on traditional um, Intel or, or AMD x86 platforms. And um, we've been looking at it from a different way for, for um, many core platforms. Specifically, what I'm talking about here is Tylera. Um, I'll get into, if people aren't familiar, what Tylera is. Um, they're, they're a company that makes um, very, some very interesting hardware, some very, very interesting products. But um, in, in general, the, the work that we've done is um, to support these many core platforms that are a little, bit <clears throat> a little bit different than what you see traditionally for x86. So um, you know, overall, what we're looking at doing is um, the front end of the pipeline. So a lot of what we've heard today throughout the, the, the talks are the back end, the analysis end. And this talk is going to concentrate more on the front end of the pipeline. Um, what we're really interested in is how do we move packets so um, between a source and a destination. So we, we have a packet coming in over the network, and we want to move it at very high speeds, very high speed being tens to hundreds of gigabytes per second, or gigabits per second. Um, eventually, we'll get to gigabytes. Let's, let's stick with gigabits for now. Um, to the right places. And, and where that right place is de is depending on where, where we are in part of the system. But not only are we moving the packets, but obviously moving a packet to the right place doesn't do us any good without analysis of the packet um, running bro scripts on those packets. So um, in the end, we need to not only get the right packet in the right place, but be able to run the analysis on it. And at these very high rates, uh, we need to do something a little bit different with these packets. We can't just say every packet at hundreds of gigabits per second we need to look at. We need to do things a little bit smarter. So from the, the packet forwarding side of things, um, it's more of a load balancing that we're looking at. And from the packet analysis point of view, um, what we're just that's general packet analysis. Um, the bottom picture is, is, is basically pictures of anyone's bro installation. So um, network traffic coming in, and generally there's a tap off of the network traffic that goes into your bro system. Um, logically, everyone has a load balancer. That load balancer might be a no-op. In a lot of systems, that load balancer is a no-op. Um, the packet comes in, the packet goes to where it needs to go. Um, in our case, that's where a lot of our intelligence is coming in, in that load balancer. We could decide to move the packet forward. We could decide to drop that packet. We could, try, we could decide to drop a whole connection based on that packet. And once we forward that on, we have a, a broke cluster in the back doing it, interesting things with the packet and feedback. So this is what I'm going to talk about the very first. Let's see, here we go. Um, a lot of it in here. Um, so throughout, um, in, in thinking about this, um, we started thinking about the problem a little bit differently. And we started thinking about it in a, in a cloud fashion or a cloud approach. Um, now, when people think of clouds, a lot of times you, you think of Amazon, one of, one of the, the big players. And um, you're offloading, you're, you're providing your data off to Amazon, and it's not on site anymore. We're not taking that aspect of cloud. We're taking the aspects where, where you think of the cloud as, as something that's elastic, um, meaning that um, there's some amount of resource that you have out there. And you want to just be able to use that resource. You want to throw more apps at a problem, or, or you want to throw more analysis at the problem, or you want to throw more bandwidth at the problem. And you want your system to elastically use the resource that's available. And so that's how we think of what, what we're working through, that we have a set amount of resource. And we want to be able to provision that resource to, to balance between 
how much cyber data we want to get out of, of the data stream and be able to handle the bandwidth that we're throwing at it. And in order to do this, what we're, we've done is we thought about it as an, uh, a combined problem. Um, so we're not optimizing just for speed or bandwidth. We're not optimizing just for analysis. But if we, if we take the two together and look at it as a single problem, that's where um, we can make some, some really great insights and come up into something that, that works really well. So we have a basic building block. Um, you know, here's, here's a basic building block. And everything is based on this um, in multiple different levels. Data comes in. We have some forwarding node. The forwarding node decides either to um, shunt the data, whether it's a, a packet or a full connection associated with the packet for some reason. Um, we say, well, we don't even have to pass that data anymore. Pass that data anywhere, just throw it out. Um, we could forward that data on. Or within the forwarder, we have added um, bro. So a lot of times, um, you have your front end forwarder and your back end bro. And we've pulled bro into the forwarder. So bro is part of the network infrastructure now. And um, that's where this analysis comes in. So there's an analysis step that has a feedback into the forwarder. And that's where decisions whether to pass something forward or shunt come from. And in doing this, there, there are two ways to think about the problem. One of them is you receive the data, you hand it to um, an analyzer, and then you make a decision whether that gets forwarded or shunted. Um, that'll work great up until a point that doesn't scale. And um, so you could, ha you could have perfect analysis. You could, well, you could have a perfect system here, um, but it doesn't really scale. So what we do is we say, all right, data comes in. We forward that data, or, or, or we shunt the data. Um, and then we do an analysis on it. And depending upon what the analysis says, if it's data, further data coming from the same connection, at a later time, we can decide that's when we drop that connection. So we might pass some packets for a connection that we don't actually need. But um, overall throughput on the system is much more improved. So if you think about it, we really have a knob. Um, and the knob says that, well, we can either have a perfect load, a pure load balancer with some static dis decisions. And in that load balancer, um, we receive data, we forward it on, or we drop it. Turn the knob the other way, and um, we have a standalone bro box. Um, we receive data, we do some analysis on that data, and we either later drop packets or we continue doing analysis. We're actually somewhere in between is the sweet spot. That's really where we want to be. Um, we don't want a, a static forwarder. We don't want um, just something that's doing analyzing without a back end cluster to do further deep analysis. So the analysis it's doing, we're doing here is fairly lightweight. Uh, we're not doing all the heavyweight analysis. There's still a whole back end bro cluster that gets forwarded out, um, that gets forwarded to and does the, the deep heavy duty analysis. But what we want to do here is to be able to make decisions as to do we want to drop this connection or not? And what do we do with this connection? And so with that basic building block, um, we've created some data structures. We've, we've created a system. We've created some algorithms to, to help us scale. So let's get into what's happening here. Um, so this is the, the, you know, the basic diagram. Um, here's, here's one of the clouds. Here's another cloud. And what I'm going to talk about, um, mpipe is the, the input into our system. That's what um, the network tap is on a Talera box. MPipe is very similar to PFRing, um, just on, on the proprietary hardware. It goes into a ring buffer. Um, we have a bro forwarder. 
we have a queuing system that says how the data moves into the various analyzers. And we have a way of getting that data back to the forwarder to make, make those decisions. So first, about the, the queuing algorithm. Um, this is a core of what we're doing to determine um, how much data goes forward in the system. So um, we call it TED queuing, tail early dropping. And um, you know, if, you, if you think about the connections and you think about the data flows, the, the interesting data is generally at the very beginning of any connection. The rest of the connection generally has less interesting data. So if you need to drop packets, don't randomly drop the packets. Drop them in a manner where you're not losing data that's interesting. So in our case, we say, well, if we have to drop packets, drop the tail of a connection and make sure that any new connection, we don't drop those packets and we, drop, we forward those packets through. So you know, th this is not new. This, this has been published in a few different places um, where the, the long tail of the data uh, that, that people have talked about. But it's a great thing to take advantage um, when you're working at higher speeds and deciding what gets dropped and doesn't. The second bit of this is um, how do we decide on queue size? And um, you know, we, we know if the queues are getting too big, where to drop that data, or what data to start dropping. But how do, we, how do we decide on queue size? And we decide on queue size by looking at machine architecture. Um, most typical off-the-shelf um, sort of hardware has various levels of caches. You know, there, there, there are some, some hardware systems um, that you won't, won't, won't see caches, but just about anything that we're working with has a series of caches and each cache, ha each level of cache has more and more latency. Um, in the specific example in the Telera system that, that we're working with, we have um, for, for L2 cache, um, which is a, a decent sized cache, it takes eight cycles to um, read data from the cache. If that was in main memory, it, it's 80 cycles. We, ha we have an order of magnitude difference between getting something out of cache and getting something out of memory. And, and basic, the same thing basically holds for Intel systems. Generally, each level of cache is about an order of magnitude faster or slower, um, no matter what system you're on. Uh, it, it's pretty close um, L1 to L2 and L2 to main memory. Um, there's, there's another level of cache that's in here from a, a remote um, process or, or, or remote core I'm not going to go into that. So if we're looking at queue sizes, what we want to do is say, well, let's make the queue size so the processes are running on a cache. And that tells us we're going to be running pretty fast rather than in that domain. And this gives us the algorithm, or, or this gives, gives us um, the, the queuing system. Um, the queuing system basically says that there's going to be some queue size where the, um, we start running out of main memory. And there's going to be some queue size where we're running out of cache. When we're running out of mint, when we're running out of main memory, we start dropping packets from the tail of connections. When we're running out of cache um, and our queues are getting smaller, then we start increasing the uh, number of packets that we're sending per connection. And so that really gives us an algorithm that looks like this. I'm not going to read it, but from uh, a, a picture purpose, what's happening is that um, we do a fast drop. So when we find out we're, we're not in cache, we do a fast drop. And then we slowly increase the the, um, the queue size. So it, it's 
a lot like networking algorithms where our, our queues are getting too big, we cut the queue rapidly, um, the queue is smaller, and then we start inching up that queue until it gets too big and we drop again. And we, we start seeing um, various different curves, but basically we find that as the queues grow, we start hitting main memory, and then the queue starts skyrocketing. Um, we could see that and say, oh, we got to cut. We cut, we're back into cache, and then we inch up a, a little bit more, and it works really well. So um, this keeps the system going and tells us what data to drop. And when it's telling us what data to drop, that means that we're not forwarding all of the data to the analyzers, to the back end bro cluster. So this is a one way that we're deciding on um, when we're running at very high bandwidths to be able to handle that bandwidth from an anal anal analyst, analyzer point of view in, well, don't even look at all the data. What's the fastest way to, um, to analyze data? Well, don't. And <laughs> that's basically our principle. If you don't have to look at it, don't look at it. Okay, so. Um, what is this thing here? Um, LF minus or LF negative. So we pass some packets, we pass some connections into um, the analyzers, and they say, hey, I don't care about this connection. There's nothing interesting here. And we have a bunch of these, we have a bunch of these analyzers, and we have a bunch of these bro forwarders. So we have basically a multi-reader, multi-writer problem. And generally, that requires locks. And any time you have a lock, things are running slower. And again, we're, we're trying to get this running faster and faster. So um, lock-free is a really big deal. So we have um, lock-free, low-false negative algorithm, LF minus. It should be, there should be a squared in there, LF squared minus. But that's more of a mouthful than LF minus is, or LF negative, or you know, we keep changing how we pronounce it. We don't really pronounce it, but giving a talk, I have to have some way to pronounce LF minus. Anyway, um, so what we really, you're stepping back and saying, well, we don't have to be perfect, but we just have to be good enough. And that means that a false negative um, is OK. False positive, bad. Meaning that if we were going to forward a packet, or if we, yeah, if, if we decided that this, this connection we didn't care about, and we did not want to forward the connection, but we do anyway, well, that's OK. That's not a bit, big deal. But on the other hand, we have false positive. If we say, well, this, this connection was something that we really care about, but we dropped it, that'd be bad. So basically, we, we can do a hash, and we can create a hash table and put the hashes into the table. Um, if the hashes are machine word size, we're short of, ato we're short of atomic rights. And we can work through that um, for packets that are coming in that we always want to forward, we'll ensure that we will always forward those. For packets that we don't want to forward, depending upon contention, there are some cases where we will end up forwarding that, and just for a very small window. Um, you know, we've worked out all the math that show the probabilities of this, um, which I'm not going into here. There's um, a conference in September, High Performance Embedded Computing, that we have a paper being published. Um, if you're in Boston, head to this conference. It's a really cool conference. I've gone a, a couple of years. It's now an IEEE conference. So it used to be um, an MIT Lincoln Lab conference only. And, and recently, it's got promoted to a full IEEE conference. Um, it's not, not in Lincoln Lab anymore. Um, and we'll have the paper available. Uh, once it's published sometime in September, if you're interested in looking at it. Um, but you know, in, in, in general, um, we've 
ha we have this data structure that says that data coming um, packets that need to be forwarded will always be forwarded. And, and that's really what we care about. OK. So um, the last part of this is uh, MPipe, getting into the hardware aspects of things. And um, so on traditional systems um, with, with um, nice Ethernet controllers and Linux or BSD stacks, there's, there's PFD, PF ring. The, so PF ring is a mechanism to um, keep the kernel out of, out of the way. Anytime there's a contact switch and anytime there's a data copy between user space and kernel space, you're, you're, you have overhead. And so PF ring is a way to um, remove that overhead to make sure that your, your packets off the wire end up in user space without the kernel getting in the way. Um, the Tyler systems we're running on, they run regular, regular Linux. They, they run a, a modified version of um, Red Hat EL. But they don't run PF ring. They have their own hardware, um, well, integrated hardware software. So that's what MPipe is. It's basically a um, Tyler implementation of a user space mechanism to get get packets off the wire into user space, and it does a, a bunch of really nice things. Um, it has forwarding capability. Um, it it has um, uh, capability to uh, inspect the packets and categorize packets and decide what goes where. Um, it has a little programmable engine or big programmable engine. There, there's, there's a lot that can be programmed in there to decide what to do and where to move those packets. So it's kind of cool. Um, OK, so on to um, new hardware. So here, let me talk about Tylera a little bit here. Um, so Tylera is a company. They've been around eight or 10 years out in, in Sunnyvale and California Bay Area. Um, spin-off from MIT uh, originally. And um, their, their claim to fame is they have massively parallel processors. So the processor I'm showing here is their latest and greatest GX36 processor. So there are 36 MIPS cores um, in a mesh. So the, the, the way they architect their systems is um, each core is connected to multiple meshes. So um, there's like four or six or something like that, individual meshes that connect all, all, all the MIPS cores together. And they're, um, they're not x86 cores. They're not clocked at 3 gigahertz. They're 1.2, 1.5 gigahertz. They're OK. I mean, they're, it's, it's not what's in your router, but it's not what's on your desktop either. Um, so so decent, decent hardware that goes in there. Um, their roadmap, their published roadmap, says that this um, generation of chip is going to go to 100 cores. What, what Tyler calls these tiles. They don't, call, they don't like calling them cores. They have to have their own marketing, so they're called tiles, um, the cores. So um, <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it has a mesh connect, so therefore it's a tile. It's not a core. Um, so in, in this generation of hardware, they're going to have a 10 by 10. Um, this is a 6 by 6. And so they, they have some cool stuff. Um, memory on board, they have uh, PISA Express that they use to connect multiple processors together and a bunch of input. Um, and this is, well, besides lots of cores, uh, we like this part too. Um, so each process, processor can take four 10 gigabit Ethernet links in. So they have a, um, a, a standalone box that has four processors, 16 gigabit Ethernet links, um, a bunch of SATA drives, USB, a bunch of other stuff in there too. So thin little 1U box. Um, we're going to be showing this um, at supercomputing. We're going to have it. Um, and you could stack a bunch of these together if you want to want to 
get much bigger. So um, we're thinking this this box itself will do 80 to 100 gigabit um, within the core within the processor itself. They also have some specialized hardware um, besides MPipe. They have um, GZip and Zip compressors, decompressors. They have um, um, a bunch of stuff for cellular compression. Um, they have some um, RSA, DSA um, engines, and you know, there's, there's a bunch of specialized engines. As each new generation of chip comes out, they have more and more specialized engines that are coming in here. So how are we using this thing? Um, multiple processors, each processor is connected inside their box. We didn't build this, they built this. Inside their box with an 80 port uh, PCI Express switch. So rather than network connecting um, the processors together, there's a PCI Express switch connecting the processors together. So one of, one of these processors looks like the master, the other ones look like the slaves. And um, throughout the talk, I've been using this picture but, but it, it really looks like this, where they have, no, now I'm blanking what TRIO stood for, some other marketing term. Um, so they have basically another, another queuing mechanism to move data between processors, um, again, without Linux being involved in here. So I could take a packet and say, well, this packet actually belongs here. And it goes over the piece of express, ends up in this ring buffer. So our forwarder is actually reading from two different ring buffers. Um, it's reading from um, what's coming off of the network, and it's reading what's coming off of piece of express. So if packets are coming in and they actually belong somewhere else, then we could do that. Um, and then everything else runs the same as I've, I've described. Um, so from a mapping point of view, uh, so going back to these little cloud cells that I've been talking about, um, a, a first level cell is something like what we have here, where we have a forwarder and a bunch of analyzers. And we could say, well, within um, a processor, I have multiple ones of these cells. And that becomes a second level cell. And we could keep stacking these, these, these cells. We could stack multiple processors together and multiple boxes together and think of each as just another cell in an, a larger and larger system. And, and that's, how, that's how we scale. Um, one other thing, you know, there, there's some tiles that um, are OS tiles. Uh, they tell her what they call um, low overhead Linux. Basically, they've done all the work to keep the interrupts off of the processors. And they've done some other work behind the back to ensure that OS runs on one or more tiles. Um, and then if your code, especially our forwarders, some, mostly the analyzers, if your code doesn't need to touch the OS, doesn't need to do it for the networking, doesn't need to do it for the PCI Express. Um, if you're not doing things that you shouldn't be doing in your code, then you're never contact switching into the operating system. And these are running 100% user space. So that's all good. Um, and so this is how we map to the hardware. But we do this through Bro. So let's go back to Bro. Um, and We've defined um, a set of enumerants. So it's a forwarder, it's an analyzer. We have things that can do both. Um, we define input interfaces. We define output interfaces. We have some variables that we define um, what things are, are happening. And then we create a table of this stuff that tells us how to configure the system, which is really cool because we can then have different com system configurations to test things. We can have um, the knobs that I was talking about. So if you're more analyzer heavy, you're more bandwidth heavy, we have these knobs. And we could just set everything up in Bro. And that lets us run for whatever 
whatever sort of um, input we want to run for. So this is a great place for the input framework. <laughs> what we're doing today is um, basically we have a table that we've created in a file. And we've create, we have a script that goes through and generates this table for us. Um, so one thing I think probably that, that one of the, the really easy things we're going to do with the input framework is rather than run our own script um, to generate this sort of table, what we're going to do is just use the input framework and read our table directly. And then we can make edits in that and it just reloads. So that's really cool. I hadn't thought about that before I came here today. So. Thanks, guys. Um, so that's how we set things up. Um, we're, we're thinking about different architectures. We're making sure that we're not tied directly to, um, to just Tylera. So, so we have an architecture, Tylera M courses, where a lot of things live. Um, our reader rings, our writer rings, our initialization for orders, and, and, and things like that are all in there. And then um, you know, this little guy down here is really important. If we're working with um, our, the, the little lightweight analyzers with in, inside the load balancer, um, then we have a shared memory queue that says this connection is no longer interesting. If we go out to the, the, the big cluster of bro analyzers, um, and something in that cluster says, hey, this connection is no longer interesting, then it just calls mcore shunt. And then it goes back into the table in the forwarder and says, if I see this connection again, just throw it away. So don't send it back out. Um, and that way, we could add some more into what's happening um, on the back end and manage bandwidth a little bit better. Um, so how does it work in practice? So we we just got our um, the hardware I was talking about the Tile GX systems and the the big four processor system. So we haven't done a lot of work on it yet. This is an older Pisa Express the the prior generation um, processor on a Pisa Express card, um, but it shows that the algorithms are doing what we expect the algorithms are doing. So in the older system, um, we needed four to eight um, forwarders to get line rate. One thing that we found in the newer system using, this wasn't using um, MPipe. This was used with kernel context switches. Um, so with the newer system, we only need one forwarder to get 10 gigabit line rate. It's really cool. We'll probably end up using two to ensure. So really, what this is showing is that um, as we add forwarders, well, for, for different numbers of forwarders, as we add analyzers, it doesn't really impact what's going on. What we want to make sure of is that we have decoupled what's happening in the system. We want to say that um, ensure that we can scale the forwarding side, or we scale the analyzer side, and they're decoupled, and we could add as many as we need to add in order to stay at line rate. And that's what, what this is doing. And the graphs will look the same. Um, in current generation of switches, uh, or at least in switches, we can get um, 40 gig to 100 gig input. Uh, the tile arrow boxes today are only 10 gig per link, but eventually we get 40 gig and 100 gig per link, and these all will look the same. The graphs won't change. Um, we just more software, more cores, more bandwidth. Um, and the other thing this is showing is that um, we have a single forwarder and multiple analyzers, and basically the queue grows. So we have one analyzer, the queue grows. We have more analyzers, the queue doesn't grow. And that's basically what we want to see, and that's what's happening. Um, so let me finish up. Uh, last slide. Uh, we have a paper in HPEC, at HPEC in September, if, if you're there. 
um, come see us. Uh, Jordy, the, the, one of the other um, folks at Reservoir is going to be at, at HPAC giving a presentation. Um, we're going to be bugging Scott at Sinet, <laughs> um, setting, setting this system up. Um, and so we're going to be showing somewhere between 10 and 80 gig gigabit per second, depending on how far we get by when we get there. Um, leveraging Telera to get 100 core processors um, and more processors in a box. Um, anyone that wants to work with us from a, a, a test bed um, or uh, testing this technology, please come talk to me. Um, really want to get this, this, this stuff out live in, with real traffic and see how it's doing. Um, and also, always need more, in, more, more people to work with us. So if you're interested in working with us at Reservoir, um, let me know. Um, we have all sorts of openings for, for people that are skilled in the art. Thank you. Thank you.